So I would like to introduce our first speaker who's starting to talk about the series, um, Dr. Robert Lawrence, who is the director of the center where I work. Um, Bob, you already said where you are the professor of. Um, you are also uh, hold a joint appointment as professor of medicine at the School of Medicine, um, and is the founding director of CLF. So he's he was doing this stuff before anybody was talking about it, um, which is great. Um, he graduated from Harvard Medical School and trained in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also a founding director of Physicians for Human Rights, uh, which is a human rights advocacy group that shared the 1997 Nobel Peace Prize for its work to ban anti-personnel landmines. He's participated in human rights investigations in Chile, Czechoslovakia, Egypt, El Salvador, Guatemala, the Philippines, South Africa, and Kosovo. He currently chairs um, PHR, the Position for Human Rights, as Board of Directors, serves on the Board of Directors of the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, and is a member of the Global Health Advisory Committee of the Open Society Institute. So we are, of course, very pleased that he is here today to introduce us to this topic of industrial agriculture. Thank you. <coughs> thanks, Angela. And uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I am going to uh, focus on a lot of the uh, problems that have really emerged in the uh, 20th century and now uh, accelerating in the 21st century. But I was reminded in listening uh, to the introductions. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, a distinguished uh, professor of psychology at Stanford University, uh, a primatologist, he's uh, studied the baboon colony in Kenya for the last 25 years and has extracted really rich information about animal behavior from that. He wrote an interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, seven or eight years ago, basically uh, linking the emergence of poverty in the human family with the development of agriculture 9,000 years ago. That prior to that, hunter-gatherer uh, groups uh, basically had to be together where nobody made it. Uh, and that all of their energy and resources were shared to uh, gain sufficient food uh, to meet the needs of their clan or their tribe. Uh, the African proverb, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, uh, probably emerged from a realization that once established agriculture was created, there were certain things, some of them related to individual uh, energy and initiative, but probably a lot of, other, a lot of others to uh, exploitation and unfair treatment of uh, neighbors allowed for the accumulation of wealth by some and the uh, production and labor required to uh, bring in the crops, create the free time for the artists and the uh, uh, inventors and all the other things that mark uh, the development of civilization. Uh, but I, when I read that and I uh, subsequently had an opportunity to talk with Robert about his uh, observation. It struck me that the food system and how it interacts with everything about the human condition uh, has really a very, very long history. And uh, we were doing relatively well in terms of uh, ecologically oriented and uh, sustainable food systems in many parts of the world. Uh, until the Industrial Revolution. And what happened in 1916, um, a couple of German scientists uh, discovered the way of fixing nitrogen using natural gas and create synthetic nitrogen, which of course, sadly, was largely used to create explosives for World War I and World War II and subsequent wars, but also to create synthetic uh, fertilizers that were a critical part of the Green Revolution that uh, Norman Borlaug, who died last year, um, was the principal architect when he, working for the Rockefeller Foundation in Mexico, 
developed a new high yield strain of wheat um, and then combined that high yield strain of wheat with uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers and irrigation techniques to uh, uh, spark the Green Revolution. What we're trying to do uh, at the School of Public Health, and it, we are based uh, at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, but we do regard ourselves as a center of the university. Um, and when we first got started, uh, George Fisher was still, at that time, the uh, chair of Earth and Planetary Sciences and graciously served on our advisory board, um, participated in the uh, what seemed kind of like endless debates before we came up with our conceptual model. Um, Carl Taylor, one of your uh, uh, church members, uh, was also part of that initial group, Reg Bowman, uh, Grace Brush, a number of very distinguished scientists throughout the university uh, helped uh, shape and formulate the uh, mission statement and the objectives for our center. It's remarkable to me that um, the connection between diet and human health has been around for a very long time, uh, including, I suspect, uh, in some of the readings in the book that uh, Angela has uh, recommended for all of you. Um, but certainly, uh, in the history of public health in the United States, <coughs> the first professor of biologic chemistry at the School of Public Health, a man named E.D. McCollum, actually uh, discovered vitamin A and vitamin D and uh, began to talk about nutritional biochemistry and while he was doing this really quite remarkable uh, uh, science, he was also writing a monthly column in McCall's magazine to translate that nutritional information to homemakers uh, in the United States going back to 1918. Similarly, and the link between environment and uh, human health has been well established <coughs> in public health. And we like to uh, recognize Anna Bacher uh, at the School of Public Health for her pioneering work. It turns out that there were a number of women who were the first to really embrace the importance of the impact of environmental degradation on human health. Um, and Anna Bacher uh, also was the first woman to be a full professor at Johns Hopkins University uh, in recognition for her concern about the <coughs> impact of uh, environmental pollution and worksite pollution uh, at Sparrows Point, at uh, the Bethlehem Steelworks, and other places where she documented the relationship between exposures to uh, things like chromates and heavy metals and so forth. What's been lacking in public health uh, is a link to the food production and how food production influences both the quality of our diet and also uh, the health of the environment. And there are some central drivers here of uh, population growth, uh, equity, and the latest one we added a few years ago, climate change because some of the things that we're now doing uh, to produce food are contributing disproportionately uh, to the greenhouse gas uh, emissions that threaten all of us with uh, climate change. Um, we call this the, uh, the Boland-Taylor model because John Boland, a uh, colleague of George's, uh, now emeritus professor of uh, economics in the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering, and Carl Taylor were the ones who uh, fun, did the fine tuning, so we recognize and uh, remember their contributions. I'm trying to stay out of the way of uh, those of you oh, over here. So, uh, Wendell Berry, the philosopher, farmer, writer who uh, uh, lives in Kentucky, made this observation a few years ago that there's no connection between food and health. Uh, people are fed by a food industry which pays no attention to health and are healed by a health industry that pays no attention to food. Um, and we're trying to change that. But it's a tough, tough battle. And uh, uh, the current uh, obesity epidemic, the current reliance on uh, uh, fast food, uh, 
the uh, disconnect that most people have between uh, the sources of their food and uh, their own personal nutrition. What the uh, Great Kids Farm is trying to do, uh, what some of the projects that you're all involved in in the Baltimore area is to reintroduce uh, our young people, our kids, to uh, the fact that you can put the seed in the ground and if you care for it, it will sprout and it will produce healthy, nutritious uh, food. This is a little bit of a cognitive test, and I, um, I'm glad that it's now uh, 5 of 9 rather than 5 after 8. I thought we were starting promptly at 8 o'clock, and I wondered whether to show this. Now you're all awake, so you can puzzle this out. We were asked um, uh, back seven or eight years ago when the school uh, was uh, rededicated and named in honor of uh, Michael Bloomberg, a very generous donor to the school, uh, to produce uh, a cartoon that captured what the Center for Livable Future was all about. Each of the centers, there are about 25 centers at the school, was asked to do this as part of a uh, coffee table book that was produced uh, at the time of the dedication, rededication of the school. So what we have shown here is that um, global population represented by the red plane is steadily uh, increasing. We're now up to uh, 6.85 uh, billion people on Earth. The uh, cheeseburgers represent how many people we could feed if everybody in the world ate the way we eat in North America. On the size of the globe represents the number of people we could feed if we had equitable distribution of food produced globally and uh, diets made up predominantly of grains, fruits, and vegetables and providing uh, 2,300, I think it was, calories per person. I'm not sure that uh, whether we use 2350 or 2300, but you get the point. So, um, in the late 1990s, the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, asked Norman Borlaug to take a look at the carrying capacity of the planet. He had done some writing about this, and um, he still had a very, very focused attention on trying to create a second green revolution, especially trying to do something with the very poor soils, the ancient soils of Africa, and uh, some of the problems in areas of uh, Latin America. Um, ideas that are now being challenged in terms of their sustainability because of the high reliance on synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticides. But he had available to him data from 1990 something on the order of uh, 450 million metric tons of food that had been produced. And he ran the calculations. And in 1990, as you can see from this, there were 5.2 billion people on the planet. But had that food being produced in 1990 been equitably distributed, and mostly grains, fruits, and vegetables, we actually could have fed 6.2 billion. So we had a whole billion uh, buffer. Uh, and yet in 1990, we had somewhere around 700 million malnourished people uh, in the world. Projecting forward, if we stay on our current path, we're only going to be, oh, I'm sorry. And at, yet at that time, we would have only been able to feed 2.5 billion if everybody in the world, as they all do, they all want to eat hamburgers. They all want to have more meat in their diet. Uh, they all want uh, fast food. Uh, the fast food franchises are springing up all over the world. Uh, and so we would have had an even larger number of hungry people if the urban elites of low income and lower middle income countries had uh, adopted the American diet. But if we look ahead to uh, 2020 uh, or 2025 when uh, estimates from uh, UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, were probably going to be at about 9.5 to 10 billion people. And with increases in production, 
um, improvements in agricultural extension and a variety of other things that don't rely on heavy chemical inputs, uh, it's estimated that we could produce enough food uh, to feed, I'm sorry, the population will be estimated about 8 billion, we could produce enough feed, um, food for about uh, 9 and a half to 10 billion. So that's the challenge. And in terms of linking environmental stewardship, uh, uh, the blessings that you talked about and the blessing the people who labor on behalf of the production of the food that we consume, and thinking about the food needs of others. Um, I think it's really captured here in this challenge. How do we confront as wealthy Americans um, and provide leadership with transforming our food system and sharing the fruits of that transformation with uh, people who are going hungry? Uh, the food shock associated with the uh, rise of uh, fuel costs in 2008 sent the um, corn on the commodity market price uh, from about four and a half dollars a bushel to uh, just over ten dollars a bushel. And that immediately had a ripple effect in terms of the amount of disposable income that poor people in low income countries were spending. They had been spending about 70% of their disposable income on food. And that took it over the top. In other words, they didn't have enough sus uh, disposable income to meet their uh, dietary needs. So we've had remarkable achievements of uh, the industrialization of U.S. agriculture, um, but it has come with significant costs. Uh, Dennis Keeney is an advisor to the uh, Center for Livable Future. He was the founding director of the Aldo Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture at Iowa State University, and now uh, is emeritus professor there and works with the Institute for Agriculture Trade Policy in Minneapolis. And in one of his papers with a colleague, Kemp, he pointed out that there were environmental, uh, public health, economic, and social concerns related to uh, the industrialization of uh, agriculture. We now have a reliance on inputs of uh, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers that exact a heavy cost in pollution and in degradation of the environment. All of us who live in Maryland can appreciate uh, the toll that agricultural runoff has had in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The eutrophication uh, through excess phosphorus and nitrogen getting into the streams and the tributaries of the Chesapeake that lead to uh, growth of algae, algal, algal blooms, uh, you suck up all the nitrogen and leave the dead zones and so forth. Uh, just a couple of quick photos. This is a typical uh, feedlot. 80% of the corn raised in the United States now is fed to animals. And then we consume the animal afterwards. And it takes seven tons of corn to produce a ton of beef. It takes four tons of corn to produce a ton of pork. Poultry is the most efficient at about two tons of feed per ton of poultry meat. But if you can imagine uh, how we could reach out to nutritionally deprived people around the world if more of our grain resources went directly to people rather than through this inefficient step down of feeding animals. <coughs> Increasingly, uh, food animal production in the United States has followed uh, the industrial route of <coughs> efficiency, uniformity, uh, concentration, and so forth. All of them leading to uh, increased yield but with enormous costs that are basically externalized to the larger population. Um, the price of the pollution, the price of the degradation of the Chesapeake Bay is not captured in that uh, package of Purdue uh, chicken breast that you buy at the grocery store. So the meat looks cheap, is cheap, but it's artificially cheap. 
I've done some work uh, with a environmental justice group in Missouri. Uh, going to be heading out there again in early February. Uh, and there are parts of the Missouri landscape where traditional 150 to 200 acre farms, multi-purpose farms with uh, uh, corn and fruits and vegetables and uh, grass-fed beef and so forth, uh, are being destroyed in terms of the ecosystem uh, by these enormous uh, hog uh, pecos, concentrated arms, uh, animal feeding operations. And you might say, well, why Missouri? The same thing's happening up in the uh, Susquehanna Valley in central Pennsylvania, and it's certainly happening in North Carolina. Very true. But interestingly enough, Missouri has a right to farm law that allows the butters of these CAFOs to litigate for nuisance purposes. So if you can document that the, the foul odor and the uh, degradation of the air quality and the water quality uh, created by these uh, operations, um, there's a chance to actually have uh, legal redress. And so the environmental justice movement in Missouri is sort of setting the pace for what we hope will be a transformation <coughs> of American agriculture. One of the issues that you probably have been hearing about is the emergence of uh, antibiotic resistance. Now, this Newsweek cover story, you can tell Whitewater anguish within the White House. This is not a recent cover. Uh, this goes back to 1994, I think. Um, March 1995. Um, but at that time, the cover story was all about excess use of antibiotics in clinical medicine. Parents of children with a, a viral upper respiratory infections coming in and demanding uh, antibiotic treatment and the busy harassed doctor saying, but it's a viral infection and the parent demanding it and then giving in, caving in because it's the easier thing to do. Uh, plus the fact that we were uh, somewhat indiscriminate in the use of uh, the newer antibiotics as they emerged in hospital practice. The issue now, however, uh, is overwhelmingly an issue related to the agricultural use of antibiotics. And this pie chart shows that uh, from a paper from the Union of Concerned Scientists called Hogginet in 2001, that about 70% of the antibiotics produced in the United States today are used as growth promoters for industrial food animal production. We don't know exactly how it works, but we do know that if you uh, put antibiotics into the feed or the water of swine and poultry, that they will reach market weight faster. Probably through suppression of the bacterial flora in the gut and less competition for transferring the nutrient value of the feed into uh, muscle mass of the animal. Well, you'd say, well, isn't that a good thing to improve the efficiency of food production? Uh, except it sets up a perfect storm for sol selecting out antibiotic resistant organisms. And then they impact uh, human health. All uses of antibiotics inevitably select for resistance. Um, Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, in a paper he gave in 1940, uh, 70 years ago, warned of the development of antibiotic resistance unless this uh, uh, new product was carefully used because he had seen that already in his laboratory. So the conditions that promote resistance in industrial food animal production are the failure of infection control. Uh, animals are packed together, a thousand hogs in a single uh, barn, 25,000 uh, broilers in a single poultry house, tens of thousands uh, now of uh, dairy cattle on the large dairy capos in the Central Valley of California in the Yakima Valley of uh, Eastern Washington. They're crowded together. The hygiene is, is I shouldn't say often, it's always suboptimal. 
uh, and then their exposure of antibiotics is widespread, it's prolonged, it's at low dose. So the low dose kills off all the susceptible bugs, creating an ecologic niche to be filled by the resistant organisms. And uh, then the stress reaction we've now uh, learned from our colleagues in animal science uh, actually increases bacterial shedding. Uh, so you have all of these things going on threatening human health. Well, can you explain what bacterial shedding is for? It just means that uh, the total amount of uh, bacteria in the uh, feces of the animal uh, and in sometimes in the upper respiratory tract as well uh, increases dramatically so that the load of new bugs in the environment uh, is increased uh, under stress. This is a, a slide taken from data in Spain where uh, <coughs> fluoroquinolone, which you may remember hearing about back in the fall of uh, 2001 during the anthrax scare, uh, because ciprofloxacin uh, is in that um, family of antibiotics, and ciprofloxacin is the only bacteria uh, antibiotic that uh, is effective against uh, anthrax. So it's a it's a precious resource that we want to uh, hold on to. Well, a resistance was beginning to appear uh, in the late 80s, and then. It was licensed for use as a growth promoter in poultry and livestock in Spain in 1990, and the resistance now shot up in a few years, almost uh, just five or six years, to 80%. Um, it was one of the few antibiotics that we have actually, through FDA action, been able to ban from use in animal husbandry in the United States. Uh, the Bayer Corporation that manufactures it fought very hard for a coalition called CAW, K-A-W, Keep Antibiotics Working. Um, the Center for Livable Future, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the uh, Food and Water Watch Group in Washington, and a number of other non-government groups are part of CAW. Then a few years ago, we were uh, asked by the Pew uh, Environmental, uh, the Pew uh, Charitable Trust to uh, assemble a commission and to examine uh, industrial uh, food animal production in the United States and its ramifications for the health of the public, the health of rural communities, animal welfare issues, and sustainability. <coughs> and on that committee, the commission was uh, chaired by uh, John Carlin, former governor of Kansas. Um, it had uh, uh, very well-known uh, people in the food systems world, like Marion Nessel, nutrition professor at NYU. Um, uh, brother David uh, Edwards, uh, Andrews, who had been head of the Catholic Rural Life Commission based in Des Moines, Iowa for 11 years, and knows more about rural America than any other person I've ever met. Uh, he was a commissioner. Uh, John Hatch, who works with the North Carolina Baptist Convention, a retired professor of social work at the University of North Carolina. Uh, we had uh, a Native American beef farmer from Montana. Um, we had uh, somebody from Cargill who resigned mm. toward the end of the commission because he became <laughs> clear that uh, the commission was going to make some recommendations not compatible with uh, Cargill's uh, own mission. Uh, but it was really a distinguished group of people who worked very hard, met 12 times over two and a half years, made site visits to CAFOs uh, all over the country, um, work, uh, met with uh, community groups like uh, Operation Reach in um, uh, Duplin County, North Carolina, where the environmental justice, injustice problems are about as extreme as uh, any that I have observed. Uh, it's a poor black community on the coastal plain, and the spray fields used to get rid of the excess um, uh, waste, animal waste, collected in the big lagoons, and when the level of the lagoon gets uh, too high and starts to violate EPA standards, the lagoons are pumped down by spraying the waste 
on fields so that it could be taken up by crops, except that they spray year round. And we have talked with people in Duplin County, uh, members of that community who have actually, depending on the wind conditions, had liquid manure sprayed against the sides of their houses and on their cars parked in their driveways. I mean, it's it just incredible some of the uh, uh, injustices that are going on. I'm not going to say anything more about the commission except that its uh, lengthy report is available on that website that Angela can provide to you. Uh, but their number one recommendation was to restrict the use of antibiotics in food animal production, to reduce the, resist the risk of antibiotic <coughs> resistance to medically important antibiotics. This is sort of a, a, a clear uh, and present danger for the American public uh, that we're trying to uh, uh, work with. We're doing, doing information briefings on the Hill. Uh, Representative uh, Louise Slaughter from upstate New York has introduced something called PAMTA, the Preservations of Antibiotics and Medical Treatment Act. And she now has about uh, co-sponsors in the House and Senate. We're hoping that might get uh, through the Congress this year. So foodborne illnesses related to all of this, about 75 million cases a year. Uh, according to the CDC, 325,000 require hospital care, about 5,000 deaths from foodborne disease, about a third of them are from tainted meat. Uh, and there's also a huge problem growing with uh, uh, fresh produce, especially that produced in large industrial farms in the Central Valley of California and in Florida. And the link there is that a lot of those large um, uh, farms that are producing the salad greens and everything else that we enjoy in such abundance now in the United States are irrigated with uh, water that's contaminated by animal waste. So the linkage between industrial food animal production and contamination of our fruits and vegetables is fairly direct. <coughs> um, a couple of uh, final comments about the linkage between diet and health. This uh, chart projecting, projecting uh, increase in meat consumption, you can see what's happening in China. Uh, India, fortunately, uh, is still uh, projected to be a relatively low uh, utilizer of uh, meat products, uh, but other uh, poor countries around the world are expected to uh, almost uh, uh, quadruple their uh, meat uptake uh, compared to 1983 data. So globally, at a time when that triple cheeseburger represented the problem of distribution for malnourished people living predominantly in low-income countries, uh, we're going in the wrong direction with regard to uh, sustainability and <coughs> uh, Here's our per capita consumption in meat. Uh, back in 1960, the uh, average American uh, consumed about uh, uh, five uh, grams of, this is nitrogen actually, uh, the nitrogen component is just a curious way that some nutrition scientists have of measuring our intake, but five grams of uh, uh, nitrogen per person per day, and now in 2000 are up to uh, six and a half. Is that, uh, Bob, is that nitrogen preservatives, nitrates? No, no, this is, this is just, if you, if you, Meat uh, is basically made up of uh, two uh, proteins, actin and myosin. Those two proteins are made up of amino acids and the nitrogen in each of the amino acids. It's a, it's a kind of, well, it's the way scientists sometimes think, right, George? <laughs> uh, it would be much more useful if I had translated all of this into proportion of daily caloric intake that was from meat as opposed to other things. But, uh, and then uh, this is another piece of our problem with regard to the public health challenge of obesity. A paper released just uh, two days ago 
showed that uh, for the first time, tobacco has been displaced as the number one cause of lost quality adjusted life years in the American population by obesity. Um, we generally think of tobacco being responsible for about 425,000 deaths uh, per year in the United States through its impact on cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and so forth. And the quality adjusted life year is a metric that allows us to take not just of the average life expectancy now for uh, an American uh, man is 76 years and for an American woman is 79 years, uh, and somebody dies at age 50, you either have uh, 26 uh, years of life loss or you have 29 years of life loss if you're a woman dying at age 50. But the quality of your life is a measure of whether or not you have low grade or more severe pain every day, whether or not you're limited in your ability to walk without a cane, crutch, or wheelchair, uh, whether or not you're uh, able to think clearly, whether or not you're able to uh, um, conceive a child or father a child, a whole bunch of other attributes are ca captured together uh, into this notion of a quality adjusted life here. It's a much more sophisticated <coughs> and accurate predictor of the burden of suffering uh, in any given population. So as obesity has overtaken tobacco uh, as the leading cause of loss of quality adjusted life years, it's mostly in the morbidity, the premature morbidity associated with uh, obesity, the osteoarthritis, the uh, other chronic conditions that begin to appear uh, while tobacco continues to exact its toll by uh, premature death. But we're adding to the problem of the obesity epidemic by our food system having introduced these larger portions. Uh, and my data here stops at 1999. If you, uh, some recent data that I've seen uh, haven't had a chance to make a slide up yet, shows that this curve is continuing. We're now up about somewhere around here, probably for 2008. Uh, Super Size Me, some of you have seen that film. Uh, all of you have been exposed to it if you've uh, uh, stopped at a uh, fast food restaurant. Uh, but portion size of restaurants uh, translates into the size of the dinner plates that are sold in Macy's and Towson Town Hall. Have you ever noticed how many big plates there are now? Uh, when I was growing up, you know, the dinner plate that my mother served us on was a rather modest sized thing. Um, and of course, this is the end result. This is what's considered uh, a, uh, a good value and one of the tragedies of the way in which the obesity epidemic is disproportionately affecting our mm. low income population in the United States is that calories per dollar, this is a better buy than anything else in the supermarket. And why is that so? couple of reasons. First of all, the cost of producing the meat has all been externalized. So it's being borne by everybody. The cost of the environmental degradation and so forth. Secondly, the predominant components of processed food are high fructose corn syrup, sweeteners, and fat. And the fat, in this case, a lot of it is animal fat, but the fat in processed uh, products that make up a large part of the uh, diet of low-income people uh, comes from uh, soybean and corn oil and other things. You can go into a supermarket and for a dollar uh, purchase uh, over 2,000 calories of sugar. And for a dollar you can also purchase over 2,000 calories of fat. In a study that one of our graduate students did on the uh, White Mountain Apache tribe reservation, uh, six or seven years ago, she found that the households that were at greatest risk for obesity 
were the households that had the greatest food insecurity. So you say, well, how can that be? Well, as she looked in detail, what she found was that the poorest, least secure members of the White Mountain Apache tribe use SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition and what's the AP? Um, assistance, assistance program. program uh, what used to be food stamps, but the SNAP program, uh, they were distributed on a monthly basis. The first couple of weeks of the month, these very food insecure families had a reasonably balanced diet. Not great, but reasonably balanced. And then that food ran out, and the last couple of weeks of the month, they were eating what? Highly processed junk food because the nutritional, uh, the caloric count per dollar spent was high. And uh, like they got into this uh, weight cycling problem that's been well documented. Accompanying, of course, the uh, growth in obesity from our unhealthy food system is the dramatic increase uh, in diabetes. It's estimated that now one in three children born in the United States will develop type 2 diabetes before they die. One in three. Uh, I remember uh, when I was in training as a medical intern that uh, we used to call it adult onset diabetes because the only people we saw with non-insulin requiring diabetes were adults and usually they were in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. Now we're seeing in pediatric practices by uh, children with type 2 diabetes. So there are other health impacts. Uh, I'm not going to go into these in detail, but uh, the extent to the environment, water, air, uh, chemicals, hormones, endocrine disruptors, a very uh, important concern with the heavy industrial uh, use of uh, herbicides like atrazine. It leads to uh, six-legged frogs in uh, uh, the Central Valley of uh, California and hermaphroditic smallmouth bass in the upper waters of uh, the Potomac. Mm. And we're now beginning to see some of the health effects of humans as well. So uh, this is the last slide and the last uh, challenge with regard to the food system that we've created. Uh, this epizootic demic cycle means that when you confine swine uh, in large numbers, and you confine uh, poultry in large numbers, and you have the humans that need to be interacting with them uh, and feeding them and taking care of them and removing the dead animals and so forth, uh, you have this opportunity for swapping of fragments of RNA between a human strain of uh, seasonal influenza a swine flu strain and an avian strain. And there's a reasonably good but not smoking gun kind of proof that uh, the H1N1 strain we're now worried about uh, um, actually was first uh, described in 1999 from a swine farm in North Carolina. So uh, this is what we need to deconstruct and we need to return to a uh, relationship with the earth and its resources that is uh, ecologically based, um, stewardship based, and that in fact uh, can be sustained for future generations. The course that industrial agriculture is on right now is already revealing its lack of sustainability in many different ways. But the forces, the political forces, are very powerful because you have huge corporations like Cargill and Monsanto uh, lined up with the large pharmaceutical firms that are producing the antibiotics, they're producing some of the other products used in animal husbandry. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a long uh, and challenging uh, uh, effort to try to uh, turn things around. But I think uh, engaging the faith communities in recognizing uh, the importance of stewardship and also the importance of our uh, responsibilities to others who are left less fortunate, whether they're within our own communities um, 
in uh, East Baltimore and West Baltimore and other parts of the state, uh, or whether they're uh, overseas in some of these desperately poor countries where uh, famine is endemic. So I thank you for the chance to meet with you and uh, be happy to entertain a few questions. Chris,